All right, this evening, uh, if you got your outlines, we're looking at something um, called the Trinitarian life. And we've been talking about the Trinity, the theology of it, for ever, it seems like, but mostly last, the end of the summer and most of the fall. And then I began to think about, well, we've got to make this practical because I believe this is the starting point. If you look at your outline there, the Trinity is the lens we look through regarding all things in life. Let me tell you how this worked out for me. I came to this backwards. This should be the starting point. This should be what we teach new believers right off the bat because you'll see when we're done that um, with this mini-series here called The Trinitarian Life, you'll see how important it is. And I started with grace in the 80s and worked my way through all kinds of topics in theology and to oneness around 2010 and between 2010 and 2012. And so, um, so this is like the end of my journey and it should have been the beginning. So hopefully we can get this right because this is the starting point. And then once you get this, then everything else just, you really don't even need a lot of the teachings that you've heard in the past on grace. In fact, you'll see a lot of messages on grace are wrong if this isn't the starting point. So let me say this again. The Trinity is the lens we look through regarding all things in life. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's say you're in a situation or circumstance. Right off the bat, you have to see who you are in Christ before you deal with the thing at hand. So it's funny because Hollywood there picked me up today to force me to have lunch with him today. And... Um, and I get in the car and he starts talking about what we're going to talk about tonight. And I said, I said, it is a hour by hour, minute by minute, constant renewing of the mind, putting on those lens and seeing everything you are going through, everything in your life through the lens of the Trinity. You have to, because if you don't, then you go to the separate mode and you're dealing with stuff in a separateness. Whereas if you go and face life and everything in life out of your oneness in God, then you're trusting the God in you that you're one with to lead and guide you at whatever is in your life at that minute, that hour, that day. Make sense? Look at your outline there, introduction, because the Godhead, the Trinity, is the starting point. If you've got your Bibles, uh, turn to John chapter 1, and I know we've already discussed this, but again... Let's not be biblically illiterate on this topic. Let's know what we're talking about. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And who was the Word? God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Now, the Word can't be God because the Word was with God. The Word is Jesus. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that word with God, with, is P-R-O-S in the Greek, and it means directed toward. This is huge. Directed toward. So, that means before God created the heaven and the earth, and if you could just get a picture of just who existed before anything else did, was the Godhead. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if you could get a picture of what they looked like, they were facing each other. They weren't sitting like we are right now. We would have to. We would be facing each other. You know how uncomfortable that would be if I had to turn and look at her and her. <laughs> all I could see was her. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'd have to look away, right? I mean, it's uncomfortable look because because the more you look at somebody the more intimate you become with that person because you're going to hear them, they're going to hear... That's what the circle is all about, is intimacy. And so when we get a picture of the Father and the Son and the Spirit toward each other, then we understand creation comes out of that. It's, creation is never separate from the Godhead. It comes out of the Godhead to be included in the Godhead. So it's never ever to be separate because if, if it was to be separate, then God's looking at you from the throne, looking at you, and you're looking at him, and right off the bat, any picture you develop after that is separate. 
Because you're looking at him, he's looking at you, and you're down here, and he's up there. But if you see that you were in Christ before that, we're going to look at that here too, in Christ before the foundation of the world, you were already in him before you were created. Creation was already in him before it was created. So it stays in the Godhead. Everything created stays in the Godhead. But sin came and made that separation in the garden. That's where the separation came from. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, worldly, humanism, religion. I put religion in that tree of knowledge of good and evil. It separates you from God. We were never to, ever to be separate from God. So that's what that word with there in 1 John. And so um, if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, go ahead and turn there. And look at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen who? Us. Us. And how did he chose us where? In, in him. him. So we came out of him in the choosing, in the creation. We, because Christ created us. Colossians 1 says all things were created by him and for him. And nothing that exists was not created by him. So you came out of him. Why? How did I come out of him? Because you were already in him. You came out of him from in him to still remain in him. But sin separated you, the Garden of Eden. What happened with Adam, the first Adam? Now look, according as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before. Before the foundation of the world that we should be not holy without sin. That's where the blameless comes in, but set apart and without blame before him. Now, what you have to see is you were in him before the foundations of the world. When you were born into this world, you were created and born out of him. And because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, he put you back in him. So let's look at it this way. If Adam and Eve never fell, they would have remained in him. They were created in the image and after the likeness of God, and there would have been no separation. But what happens is the fall happens, sin comes, separates them, and from the first Adam to the second Adam, men are born, in, born into this world separate. If you, this is all in Romans 5. We looked at that, if you remember. Now, Romans 5 tells us, in Christ, all live. In Adam, what? All die. In Christ, all live. So after 2,000 years, he fixes... 2,000 years ago, he fixes what Adam did 6,000 years ago. So now when we're born into this world, we are born in him. It's just we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. And so what the evangelism is supposed to be about is to let people know what Jesus did. Because watch, he says, while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. Okay? And then it also says God was in Christ on the cross. God was in Christ doing what? Hiding from him? What does it say? God was in Christ reconciling the world where? Back to him. To himself. And so the cross reconciled you back to him before you were even born into this world. Because you were already in him before the foundation of the world. But Adam screwed your future birth up. But Christ came. Thank God you weren't born in the old covenant. It's a lot better now in the new covenant. It's a whole different ball game. It's a whole new world. But religion doesn't want you to see <clears throat> that. Now, how many have heard this statement? You go to witness to somebody and you go, well, you need to accept Jesus Christ into your life. And the invitation is we ask people to accept Jesus into our lives. Right? Come up, come up to the altar and accept Jesus into your life. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we heard that all our life. But if you understand it through the lens of the Trinity, he's already accepted you into his life. I'm not accepting him into my life. He accepted me into his life in the Trinity 2,000 years ago, but it was already done before the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when you're witnessing somebody, you have to see Christ is in them, God's already reconciled them to himself, and all you've got to do is be the revealer of the good news 
Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. And hope the lights come on. Is it fair that I get... Who got saved late in life? Who got saved late? How, how old were you? I was probably 40. 40. I got saved at 15. I must have been smarter than her. <laughs> How'd that happen? I mean, she wasted... How many... I mean... I wasted a lot because I was raised in religion. But... Um, he claims he was saved when he came out of his mother's womb, so I don't do that. <laughs> he's always been saved as far as he's concerned. But why is that? You ever wonder why someone gets saved at an early age and then it takes somebody else clear to their 70 or 80? Smith Wigglesworth, one of the greatest revivalists, I think he was like, I don't even want to say, I, he was an old man. He was late in his years, maybe 60 or something like that. I think he died in his 80s or something. But, um, That's not old. <laughs> no, it isn't, is it? I'm speaking like I'm 20. An old man when he got saved. But um, why is that? I, I don't know except that maybe, and maybe sometime we'll find out, someone didn't tell her the truth right. And it turned her off because it, was a, it, was, it came out of darkness, out of religion, and her spirit couldn't grab it. I don't know. No one witnessed to me. I just came to a crisis in my life and called out to God and then the rest... You know, I got involved in church after that. But the point is, I, I, don't, I don't know that timing, but I do know no one is outside the scope of getting saved. Because we're all in. If you go to Acts chapter 17, now you, somebody may want to turn there. Acts chapter 17. You, well, let's just turn there. Because I, I just don't want you to debate me on this because I'm going to show it to you. Let's just forget about the debate. Um, Somewhere in 17, he's talking to this men at, Mar at Mars or something. Um, verse 13, they uh, brought him unto Athens. Paul waited for them at Athens. Then verse 18, certain philosophers of um, whatever encountered him. And um, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be set forth of strange gods. And they took him and brought him. And Paul stood, look here, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. Now these are smart men. Learned men. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription on it to an unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him I declare unto you. This is the God I serve, that one you say it's unknown. God, now watch. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temple made by hands, nor is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything. And um, let's jump down. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him, now look, he's talking to people that are unsaved. Now look what he says here. For in him we live. Why are you saying we, Paul? Don't include me in that. You live. He's including everybody he's talking to because we were all chosen before the foundation of the world. Watch. Um, For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So he's including them in this message. And he's trying to illuminate to them what Jesus did for them. That make sense? All right. Anyway, this was all done before the foundation of the world. What, and Jesus made it possible after the fall. He comes and says, nope, we're doing this thing. Jesus is to secure the purpose and plans of God before the foundation of the world. So everything's in Christ. So everything can only be fulfilled in Christ. Okay? So now we come along, and what we're doing is preaching Christ to each other. To the lost, to each other, Christ is the message. 
All right, so look at your outline there. So our whole existence, well, if you come down here in Ephesians 1, 6, he says he has made us accepted in the beloved. He's made us accepted, has, past tense, made us accepted in Christ, in God. All right, so our whole existence, our essence is of the Godhead, one with the Father, not separate. If you don't close the gap of separation, you're not going to manifest the fullness of God in your life. Although the fullness is there, there's nothing lacking in you, there's nothing missing, but you're going to try to get into a room you're already in if you have any separate mentality because that separate is the gap that keeps you out of the room you're already in. That makes sense. So we are bound together in the circle of life as shared eternally by the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So the Trinitarian life is the starting point that we need our minds renewed on daily as we engage life on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-by-minute basis. If you look through the lens of separation, then it's all on you to figure it out, and you're going to have failure and frustration. All right? So we're going to be looking at different topics in the, in the weeks to come, probably finish out the year, because <clears throat> look at these topics. Now, we're, I'm, I'm, I just threw these out. We may, we may not get into all of them, but like obedience. I hate that word. I was raised to hate that word because I was browbeated with that word. And I, I found other words to use and because I hated it. Because I didn't understand it through the lens of the Trinity. I was trying to understand it just through the lens of grace and grace versus law without the oneness understanding. But obedience is flipped and turned upside down and it's not what you think it is. Money. It's not what you think it is. So you, your, 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 whole, your whole take on money is going to change. Health and healing. That might not change, although how you get it may. Spiritual warfare, it's not a warfare, it's conquest. I don't know who came up with that. Prayer, I'm telling you, when we get done, we definitely will do prayer. Because it's not what you think it is. It's not what, Fasting, it's not what you think it is. Once you look through the lens of the Trinity. Honestly, how many of you give yourselves to prayer? I don't blame you because you still have a religious separate mindset regarding prayer. Fasting, oh my God, all you can think about is I'm not going to be able to eat my hoagie tonight. <laughs> Spiritual gifts, we don't use them. <laughs> it's, it's, now, it's now what's your motivational gifts? Screw the spiritual <clears throat> gifts. Let's just, you know, use motivational gifts. But nobody's operating in spiritual gifts anymore. Or, and, and you don't know how to recognize your daily grind through religion. You, you think your daily grind is the secular world, and there is no secular world, once you understand this. And recreational stuff, we have the church is called worldly, you're not allowed to do, is what he, he, he created for you to do to enjoy life. We're going to turn this thing completely upside down, and church and religion has taught you the flip side of agony. It's the hee-haw song. Gloom, despair, Agony on me, deep, dark, depressed. Why do I know this? Excessive, Excessive misery. <laughs> Gee, I, I don't know why I know that. So I got Randy here. Uh, let me just sidebar this. Randy, for most, most of me don't know this, she's the, she um, has been the associate pastor of Restoration Church since 2011. Because when I went through my divorce in 2010, I don't want to be ministering to women. That's, you know, that's not my role. And so um, I asked her to come on board to, you know, be there for any woman that needs ministry and to help me uh, on the pulpit and everything. And so um, well, how many years is that? Eight now? Yeah, eight years. And um, so because I asked her to join, uh, join me tonight over this introduction to this series because she had something happen to, happen to her that she shared briefly uh, Sunday morning, I wanted her to expound on a little bit before we jump into the rest of this, and something she noticed. Now, we're not being critical. We're not dividing. We're not being divisive. We're being observant. And she observed something and came back and shared it, and I want her to share <laughs> that in which she observed. Okay. So recently, my husband and I went to a um, worship-themed conference, and um, fantastic worshipers, worship leaders, um, and so we went in not really knowing how it was going to be. A lot of conferences that I went to about worship, they break them up into different classes. Well, this was just 
coming together to worship. And um, they spoke very little, but they did have um, say things as God led them to. And of course, it was opened up by the um, pastor of the church. And immediately, um, I saw separation from just the whole theme of the worship conference. And I was like, wow, because I, you know, we don't get out there that much and go to different places and we don't see a lot of this. I listen to very few people. I don't watch TV like Greg does. <laughs> no, I listen to, <laughs> I listen, I have, you know, a few, very few people I listen to and um, I usually pick and choose through their stuff what I listen to. But so the whole theme was um, confession, cleansing, and communion. And I was like, wow. Because immediately it was confess your sins. Get that, just let's wipe, you know, get that out of the way. You've got to get your sins um, confessed to God. And, or if you feel led to somebody, get them confessed, get them out there. Um, so let's move on to let's get rid of the sin. You know, we're going to have cleansing. And then later, you know, communion. So they went through all of these steps. And I'm just going, wow, we, they really, we really have been separated. So, you know, I at first was like really sad. I was like, I kept looking at Daniel going, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know our oneness in Christ. They don't see who we are in Christ, who they are in Christ, and who Christ has called us to be and what he's raised us to and the purpose that he created us in him and for him and to commune with him and to love him and they they see it as this process they're on the outside of this trying to fight their way in by doing these steps by doing this confession and you can't get to <clears throat> communion unless you do the confession and the cleansing and then you get to the oneness should you, should you see that what that particular those people did was that they didn't see themselves already in the room so they're going through the hallway going through this that they're they're, they're going to get to that room but this is what we got to do to get to that room and how long did that take now if they're only going to get together for a couple of hours that may take an hour long you know and then the people who still feel like i'm not worthy to walk into that room Maybe their sins are greater than somebody else's. There's just too many dynamics that can happen within that, that mentality when they should have walked through that door already in the room, knowing they're already cleansed, knowing they're all... And they, they can... It's almost like... Think about this. When, you're, when you were dating somebody, you would go to the beauty salon, you'd go to Dollar General and buy some perfume, and, you know, get, buy a new set of clothes, and wash your car and go to the ATM and you're doing, you're preparing for the date. So well that's just you're just not proving your point. No, no. When you get married there is no preparation. You wake up and you blow hot, blow your bad breath in her face. What kind of preparation are you going to do when you're married? None. Your hair's all over the place, there's no makeup. Um, kids are I mean there is what kind of preparation are you doing? That's that's that, that, that's long and gone. You know, once, and that's what we do. We're preparing for Jesus in our church services. <clears throat> when once we understand we're married and we're one, we can we can walk in there with bad breath and crazy hair. See, I don't got I don't have to. I'm complete in Him. I'm accepted in the Beloved. And there, just told you that Ephesians one six, we are accepted in the Beloved. I don't gotta look good. I just because I am good in His eyes. But, but do you see that how? You start the service off in Him. Yeah. Already done. Now we can rejoice at all that's done. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, their songs were great. They, they had you in Him. <laughs> but it was like they, 
in their personal selves and your personal self you had to build up to that you and i could see it i was amazed i was actually dumbfounded and i went through all kinds of emotions i went through the sadness like daniel they don't see it and then when the cleansing time came and they called people up to the the altar to get rid to let god cleanse them of that sin that they had confessed written whatever and I, and then they told people that didn't go up to come up behind them and pray that they would get that cleansing. And I was like going back and forth in the pew. And Daniel was laughing at me. I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I can't even take this. This is like killing me. And it was killing me because they didn't have the revelation and my heart was like grieving for them because I thought, how many times have these people gone to this altar and tried to lay down the sin. And they can't get rid of it because they don't realize it's already gone and who they are in Christ. So Daniel was like, that's just how we need to pray then. So we kind of, we were in the second row. So we stepped out of the second row and went up, stood in front of the first row. And that's just how we started praying together is God give revelation, bring revelation to these people, to, to, um, so they can go back to their churches and that they can bring that revelation to their churches. And then I started to get angry, but not with them, with the enemy, because how we've been deceived. Because I used to be that person. There was no judgment. Because I used to be that person at that altar <coughs> saying, God, fix me, because I can't fix myself. And I can't get rid of this sin. I can't get rid of these thoughts. Or I can't get rid of this anger. Or whatever it was. Fix me. Constantly going back to that altar. Fix me. Fix me. Fix me. And then I just. I was amazed. Because it's already done. And I then I got excited. Because I went Daniel. We're getting the revelation. <laughs> we. I didn't know it. I've questioned in things that I've seen in myself. Are we getting this? Because God knows I want to get it. I'm hard on myself, and I want to get this revelation. I want to know who I am in Christ and who he is in me because I want to see those miracles, signs, and wonders, and I'm tired of seeing people beaten down and broken inside and out of the church because they don't know who they are in Christ. So then I got excited and I said, we're getting it. Look at all this separation that we see firsthand because we're getting the revelation. We're seeing who we are in Christ. Now we can mm -hmm. tell people who they are. And I get crazy looks all the time at work and wherever I am because I talk to everybody like they've been raised in church <laughs> and I just start telling them you know what God has shown me and I'm one with Christ there is no separation there my sin's been taken care of and they look at me they're either not saved and they look at me like I'm an alien or they are saved and they look at me like an alien still because they don't see that they don't have that revelation so this um if nothing else, which no, it was amazing. The songs were good. I just worship from where I am in Christ because that's what I went there to do was just to worship and fellowship with these people. And it was awesome. They, um, very good spirited people. I, you know, they're kind, loving. They want this, what we have, because they were crying out for it. They, and they finally got to it in communion. <laughs> but we were already there from the time before we even walked in the doors. We were already there. And it, it was very eye-opening to see because, like I said, I don't go anywhere anymore. I don't hardly ever go to special <clears throat> services. I've gone to this specific place um, for the past few years just to um, when they bring in the work. But this was the first time they've had, like, a worship Conference. I've just went for a night of worship with some of my favorite worship leaders that I listen to. And um, even from then, like three years to now, seeing the 
the revelations that God has given me and he's given our church and who we are in him and who he is in us and that there is no separation but it's out there they and that's what the enemy wants he wants to keep us separated from God and I'll tell you since that revelation there's been an attack you know the enemy has attacked and but I see it and it hasn't bothered me because I'm like I know who I am and you don't have that strong voice anymore to bring me down to that place to where I'm outside I'm I'm in Christ I don't need to push my way in and that's a lot of what was happening um, the whole weekend was they were pushing their way into worship to get to that oneness with Christ for that little bit of time and then when it's over it's over. it's over they walk back out the door supper don't and like she said they only they did get the worship right that's when they're one they they for the most part they you know they they, they recognize that to some degree in worship but look all that they have to go through to get there and they're only there for a short period of time and then they're right back out the door living a separate life the next six days out of the week and not recognizing this oneness but yeah go ahead you have anything else no I think that was it uh, look at your looking at your outline we're at number one. What actually happens as a result of what Jesus did in a believer's life? All people's life, but especially a believer because they're awakened to it. If you got your Bibles, turn to John 14. This is for the sake of those maybe just watching for the first time. So I know you've seen this verse before. But in John chapter 14, verse 20, Jesus said, At that day... Resurrection when he's raised from the dead at that day and glorified in heaven at that day ye shall know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you if you jump down to verse 23 he talks about how they come the father and son will come by way of the spirit and make their home in you in, because that's oneness that's the place he goes and prepares for you is in the Godhead not a cabin in heaven that's just a bad translation because the Greek is abode. It's the same word here, abode, in the Greek. So why didn't they translate abode here, cabin? Wouldn't make sense, would it? Put in their cabin. We will make our cabin with you. But it's the same Greek word. So the translators were wrong in the King James. They should have just stuck with abode or dwelling place. Because Jesus goes and prepares a place for us in the Godhead that we got separated from through Adam, the first Adam. All right, so oneness occurs there. B, it was the grace of God to give of himself. Understand he gave himself to you. The givingness of God, his life for us to share in. See, the fall separated us from the Trinity. D, but through the incarnation, God entered into humanity, bringing his life into ours, joining us in our humanity. That's the incarnation. Not separating us from humanity, but joining us in your humanity. Church is trying to get you out of your humanity. But no, he entered into your humanity. But he brought his divinity. You have to understand, when he, before Jesus came, we were 100% human. And he was 100% God. That's your separation. But he came into this world through incarnation as the vicarious man. And he entered into our humanity, joining your humanity and bringing with him his divinity. So now you share in his divinity while he shares in your Amen. humanity. That's called the new man. You're no longer just human. You're a new man, which means you're divine and human. Partakers of his divine nature, Peter says. So... Through the incarnation, God entered humanity, E. Yet, he, yet we join him in his divinity, him joining, and joining him in the heavenly realm, F, God has now sent heaven and earth. I don't know if we taught on that a whole lot, but let me just give a few minutes on that. Do you understand when Jesus said, pray on earth as it is in heaven? He's synced, when he came, he synced heaven with earth. 
When he brought humanity, he brought heaven on earth. I did a, a tweet, I think it was a while back, said, we are in heaven on earth. Because it is, heaven and earth is no longer separated. When, when God came to earth, if, is Jesus God? <clears throat> Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So heaven, is, is heaven bigger than God or is God bigger than heaven? God is heaven. So when God came to earth, heaven came to earth. He's, and if you don't get this, then you're going to give the, de the earth over to the devil. He synced heaven and earth. So there is no such thing as a secular life and a spiritual life. A worldly life and a spiritual life if you're in Christ because he joined in your... Fission is not worldly. Did the devil make up fission? You want to go fishing this weekend? Is that, a, is that an evil thing? Who made up? No. You can fish in God. You can play soccer in God. You can drive a race car in God. Who, you know why the church don't like those things? Because you can spend your money on them in time, and they want all your money in time. <laughs> Come on, it's control. God synced heaven and earth, so now you can enjoy things with him, not separate from him, but with him. And, and, and do those things with a spirit of excellence because it's God doing them through you. That make sense? Yeah. yeah. So get, don't, don't have a, well, the daily grind is not God, but I'll get into God when I go to church. No, but no housewife ever sees doing clothes, grocery shopping, and cooking those groceries, and doing the laundry as a spiritual thing. But if God's in you, this is what the, the book Practicing God's Presence with Brother Lawrence is all about, I told you about getting. It's a little tiny book, probably five, six bucks on Amazon. It's probably free on Kindle. You know, it's so old. But um, this man learned how to do what he did with God and broke free from that mentality of world versus spirit, secular versus you know, church. He, he saw himself always in the Godhead in any place he was at, he was always in the God. Do you, do you slip out of the Godhead when you go fishing? No. That's just stu the stupidity of the church. So he synced heaven and earth together. So now you walk on earth in heaven. You're in heaven walking on earth. Because you're seated in heavenly places. Right? So you're in heaven on earth. Now, um, G. God gave us himself in Christ. And we become partakers of his divine nature. All he is, H, all he is, his inheritance is, is us. We are his inheritance. And his inheritance is in us. His purpose is in us. And he brings to completion his life and achieving his end in us. You need to, I, I just highlighted this stuff you need to meditate on. Because those are, those are real huge one-liners. I. Our life is rooted, bound together with His. That's what the John 15, the vine and the branches is about. J, we begin to see ourselves as He sees us. There, I would say most Christians do not see themselves as God sees them. So this is why we're going to get into all these topics. Now we're going to look at all this stuff that we got taught by religion. And now we're going to have to flip it and see it now through the lens of the Trinity. And for instance, self-worth. Not very many people have any self-worth. <clears throat> is, it, is it a good thing to hate yourself? But the church is always telling you to deny yourself. Well, well how could I love what I'm supposed to deny? I'm in, what is there to deny if I'm in the God and I'm one with Him? The only thing I know to deny is these bad thoughts and the unrenewed mind that I'm denying. And that's 2 Corinthians 10 where he says, take every thought captive. Yes, I'll deny those. But the denying was what he did. He's the vicarious man. He, he denied himself. He took up the cross. When he was denying himself, I was in him. He was denying himself for me and as me. As me. Now once I'm in him, the work is done. Now all I'm denying, what you thought denying self was, is simply denying the stupid thoughts and the sinful thoughts that's still a residue of when we were in the old man or even in the religion. The, 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 the sinful nature. 
Now think about the sin. Do you have a sinful nature now that you know you're in the Godhead? Is there any place for a sinful nature when you're one with him? No. Man, that's, it's almost like, oh, I, you mean I really used to believe there was a sinful nature? Now that I know this, I don't have to think about it. Automatically, there can't be. I'm in him. Jesus said, you are in me. I am in you. As he is, so are we in this world. I, I have to identify. See, self-worth changes. I'm not loving myself apart from him. I'm loving myself as him. I love him. How can I not love myself? <clears throat> God's not into you hating yourself. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. He don't want you hating yourself, looking in the mirror you, or looking at your past. There's too much self-hatred going on in the church, and religion has is, is endorsed that. We're not happy with ourselves. We're not happy the way we look. We're not happy with our body. We're not happy with our mind. We're not happy with nothing. And we're miserable because the world keeps f flashing all this better, better, better. And look, I'm not GQ, and if all I do is read GQ magazines, I'm going to be depressed. I mean, I'm going to like, I, I just, you're not going to get me in the skinny jeans, so I guess I'm just not going to be that and feel like a second-class baggy jean man. Huh? Come on. They, they parade this stuff in front of us to make you feel bad about yourself when God said, that, that's, that's not me. That's what the world, the world wants you to feel bad about yourself. But you, if you know who you are in me, and I created, every, I created your nose, I created your eyebrows, and I knew when you were going to be 50, you were going to start losing your hair. you, you got to love that. But we're looked at, look, that's a bad thing. Who said that's a bad thing? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and it is so, it's so shallow to judge each other by appearances when we should accept each other because we are, if we truly believe we were created in the image of God, I'm created and I look exactly like I'm supposed to look. If you don't like it, sorry. You don't got to live with me. You don't got to look at me. Actually, that's why that I have video and audio in case you don't want to look at me. You can just listen to me on audio. <laughs> Uh, somebody out there likes me, I guess. I don't know. Where am I at? Okay. Okay. His thoughts of you are higher than you have of yourself. But if you never get and start listening into what how he thinks, see, when you're in the Godhead, you take up the communication. You're you're in the. There's a life going on there. There's communication going on there. You want to stay separate from that? I want to be in there and I want to hear what he has to say about me to me. His thoughts, David said, if you could count his thoughts, the, you, you, num, there's no number, all the thoughts he has. You can't count them. So I, I want to be in on hearing what he, has to, what, what he thinks about me, how he feels about me. Because watch, K, his thoughts of you are higher than you have of yourself and greater than what others have of you. So I don't care what my next door neighbor thinks of me. I don't care what the pastor down the church down the street that church thinks of me. I can't help what they think of me. I can't help what people think about me, about what I've done in the past. All I know is what he thinks about me. And it's a lot better than what they think about me. So woe be unto them. How come they can't think of, if they're in the Godhead, how come they don't have the same thoughts toward me that God does? Seems like there's a little separateness going on there, isn't there? Wait till we get to unity. I, I, it's going to blow you out. I, I promise you, if it doesn't, then I'll buy your dinner. Because you, you've never heard unity like this. Never. I caught a glimpse of it in the late or early 90s, um, listening to a message by Malcolm Smith, and I'm like, that can't be. But no one ever went on with it. I, got, I lost it. I didn't know one this back then anyway. He did. By the way, Malcolm Smith's probably the only guy that's on, well, there's a few other ones. There's, there's, like, there's like maybe a half a dozen that really got this, that you can get in all their messages, especially him. But anyway, um, L, God enters our pain. Jesus, in his, in his incarnation, enters our pain, suffering, weakness, and sin. The darkest place you have in your life, it's not... 
so people can deny you and walk away. That the darkest place in your life, if we just held, hold on and wait it out, Jesus is in that darkness. <coughs> but we run from people. We talked about that already. So in our darkest place, Jesus is there to bring light. By renewing our mind, the truth sets us free. M. God has desires. Now here's where I want to spend some time here with M and the closing. God has desires. And if you're one with him, how does those desires work with you? Let's say, let's say me and Randy are one. She's God, I'm Greg. She's the Godhead, I'm Greg. And I'm in her. And she has a desire um, for, well, let me just use me. So she has a desire to preach and teach and make disciples. That's her desire. So I become one with her. What do you think happens? I got it. That's what happened. If you would have came to me before at 18 and said that I was going to be a pastor, I would say, you God, get out of here. It was so far from me at 18 that that's what I was going to do. So if, I, if Michael Jordan enters into you and you become one of Michael Jordan, guess what sport you're going to start playing? See, when God comes into you, he's got to do something with those desires. He doesn't compartmentalize desires and emotions and this is my life and my desires and man, you keep yours and I'll keep mine and we'll, we'll call it oneness, but it's really not. No, when I'm really one with him, Whatever he desires for me automatically gets downloaded to me. It's like a file off the internet in your computer. As soon as it gets there, all of a sudden, I have new drives, new desires, because I'm one with him. And so the church has always made you feel like what you wanted and what you desired probably wasn't God. But what's he supposed to, where, do you, where does your desires and drives come from? We have to start paying attention to what we feel, what we sense, our intuition, our drives and desires. Now, of course, if they're sinful, the, you know what sin is. Do I have to, we have to talk about what sin is? You know what it is. You know what's right. And if you don't, the Holy Spirit will be the first one to show up to tell, prick your heart and say, nah, that's not who we are. I told you, I, I was out of town one day. This is probably 2013, 2012, 2013, and I'm um, spending some time with somebody, and I wasn't supposed to be there. I think I told you about this. And I'm telling you, I, w I mean, you would have thought God left, the Holy Spirit left me, and I was in utter darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was that bad. I, was si I wanted just to leave, but I couldn't because I made a commitment. And I'm sitting there thinking, I got to get home ASAP. I shouldn't be here. This is wrong. Not that it was sinful as much as I just shouldn't have been there. And, and it's like, wow, what direction was I going that you put a roadblock up like that? Because some of us are a little hard-headed more than the other. Sometimes it's a little prick. Eh, I shouldn't have said that. And it's over with. This thing lasted 24 hours. And if I said, if I don't get home, I'm, I'm a dead man. Literally, probably not, but it felt like it. Now, just as much as he's in there giving you desires and leading you with good stuff, he's also going to pull the reins back and prick your heart, ruin your peace, and disturb you till you get it right. You, I don't, do we understand what oneness... Oh, we can celebrate the good part of oneness, but also there's another part of oneness where he'll reel you in because he is committed to you. He sent a son for you. He, he, he brought you into the, the, the holy trinity, the circle of life there. He ain't letting you go. So, desires, emotions. How about the will of God? Don't seek the will of God. He is the will of God in you. It gets You just know it as you go, as he reveals it. You just know it. Just rest. He opens up the doors. Don't, don't be... Every one of you, you're in the will of God right now. Now, if you're doing something wrong, that doesn't mean you're out of his will. Talk about freedom. We were talking about this at lunch. I'm not free. And neither are you. Because I asked him the question today at lunch. I said, do I have the freedom to sell my house... 
pack everything up and move to Texas or Florida or Arizona because there's only three states I'm going or stay here. C can I do that? Does, it, does anybody forbidden me to sell my house? Anybody stopping me from moving to any one of those three states? Am I free to do that? No, I'm not free to do that. You can't get me to do that. There's absolutely nothing in me that will do that. Yet. And maybe never. The only way you can get me to do that is put a gun to my head. Well, I guess i got to sell my house. i got a gun to my head. Then I'm not free, am I? So you say you're free. You ain't free. It's according to the who you're one with calling the shots. That's why Paul said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I'm a slave. I'm in him, and whatever he, wherever he goes, I go. Whatever he says, I say. I'm all about him, not myself. So I can't just get up and do whatever I want to do. So there you go. That's the will part of it. Thoughts? If I'm one with him and he thinks something, guess what? I would say that 98% of the thoughts you thought was you was really God speaking to you, and you thought it was you. But you, you, you've made this, this dualism that religion has created, that, that God has his own thoughts, you have yours, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm sure some of those thoughts, you know whether they're yours or not, because whether they come, they're sinful or they're good. But we've got to, like, like I'll start praying to God. And I'll say some profound things to him in my prayer that I would never thought of. But they were just flowing, right? That wasn't me. That was God's thoughts and God's voices with me praying. And now I'm recognizing that when I'm praying, I'm just probably more than likely prophesying what he's saying over the situation or circumstance. Because I come up with some pretty good stuff when I pray. It's not me. I'm like, well, I should take that and turn that into a prayer. And get religious with it. It's not too late. You thought it's thought. You spoke it. It's done. I'm telling you, once you get this and understand, you can't wait to think a thought. You can't wait to pray a prayer. Because it's all coming out of oneness. It's all coming out of God and you together. If, once you get that. Um, so um, what is he going to do with those things of desires and emotions? He's going to share them with you. He's going to reveal them to you. He's going to unveil them to you. And oneness proves him. Oneness proves all those things. What he feels, thinks, and does through us and with us. Okay, closing. Time we got there. But we're good. Closing. He has given his very life to you. You share in the life of God. Now let that sink in. You've got to meditate on this. There, there is a difference. Now watch. Listen to this. I heard Malcolm Smith say this, and he just said it in sidebar, but I had to stop and go, Whoa! And I think he said it last week. He says, there is a difference in wanting a glass of water or having a glass of water or being that water. Tell me the difference. Now that you got to meditate on. Because you could be sitting there going, oh, I'd like to have a glass of water. Oh, and, and you know, that's a whole different scenario, wanting a glass of water when you're thirsty, Right? It's a different scenario, a different whole situation if you've got the water in your hand and you're drinking it. Is it half full? Is it full? Or is it, is it empty? Is it not very good? Is it lukewarm? Is it cold? Is it? I mean, there's all kinds of variations having that water, but it's a whole other scenario being that water because you're not wanting it. And you're not like, what do I do now that I have it? No, you just are it. And until we understand we are in the Godhead, we're not becoming, we are. And the only thing it looks like it's becoming is just your mind is being renewed and you're coming into who you already are. But there is no work in progress. It's just you coming into by renewing your mind who you've always been all this time in Christ. In the Godhead. One with Him. You are a product of a perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 10 says that you have been made perfected. You are perfected by that one sacrifice. Paul says you're complete in him. And John says you're one with him. As he is, so are you in this world. So you need to keep discovering your perfection. And the church is always pointing out your imperfection. But your imperfection is a flawed understanding of who you are. 
<clears throat> that's all imperfection is. You're already perfect. That's why you're in the Godhead. You would not be in the Godhead if you weren't perfect. Sorry. If that high priest could not go into the Holy of Holies because he had a zit on his face, <clears throat> come on. I think that's a bit being too perfect. You realize if they put a if they if if a, if a guy brought a lamb to be sacrificed, and there was a little scar on that lamb because he went through the briar patch and got got cut a little. God don't want that. Don't bring that that lamb that's ninety nine point nine percent perfect and offer it up to me. I see that little scar on him. And priest, you got a zit, and you're sweating in your underwear. Get out. And you're going to tell me we're going to be in the Godhead with a sin nature and not perfected? No, nah, come on. This doesn't make any sense. You are the water. You don't, going back to what she shared, those people are thirsty for water, right? They're trying to get water, and they finally got water for that little 20 minute worship span. But the minute they drink that water, they're going to go right back out that door, either not having it or wanting it. Huh? They are the water. In fact, they are so much the water, Jesus said in John 7, 38, out of your belly will flow. What? You're a, you're, you're a, you're a Niagara Falls all the time. You don't got to go get that water. You don't got to go drink that water. You are that water. Out of your belly. Now, what? Now I guarantee you that many of you probably never see yourselves as an um, instrument of living waters always flowing out at any point in time. No, just when we go to church. Well, I got to get myself ready for worship. And then here, oh, oh here, here comes the gusher. I just got cleansed. Now, I'm being facetious and probably... Shouldn't, but you get what I'm saying? Are you, 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 are you, you, you're gonna unplug something and let you are walking, living waters gushing out, ready to happen on somebody. But you don't know that, so you walk around in a funk half the day because you don't know who you are. You don't, you're spiritual 24/7, but you don't know that. You got water coming out of you all the time that could minister, and 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 and, and yet, I, why, why do I feel? And when I start feeling like I'm not that. That's when I renew my mind on who I am and who I'm in, and I know those waters are there. So, so the Trinity and our inclusion in that circle of life right here on the board is all about the abounding life, the fellowship, the togetherness, the love, the passion and joy that those three share. Let me ask you something. Let's go back. Is there life in that circle, in this circle? Is there life there? Yes. Is there joy there? Yes. Is there depression there? No. Is there anxiety there? No. So let's look at this again. Look at the outline. The Trinity and our inclusion in the circle of life is all about the abounding life, fellowship, togetherness, love, passion, joy that these share, and there's more, that's just all the time. And you are there. Why are we not engaging and encountering all the above? Who lied to us? What's religion saying? Why does religion keep me out of that circle? Have me has me always working to get there, working to get joy, working to get love. I start there. I am that. Sorry. Any questions or comments? Do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I thought I did, but now I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody, while she's thinking, does anybody have any comments? Tonight is the first night that I got out of our belly full flow the river of the living water. I got that tonight. You, you, but you've read that before. Yeah. You're aware of that. That was the time, and I never got it till tonight. And it hit me before you said that. It just. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of scriptures that you know that you can quote but you haven't looked at them through the lens of this yet and they're going to flip flop you're going to like oh my god doesn't mean that it means this and it's going to change everything it'll always change into good news if anything you if you look at the life through the lens of the trinity and it's not good news you're not seeing it right 
It has to always be good news. Because it's the gospel. The good news of the gospel. And this, you know, she talked about having miracles, you know, so we can start seeing miracles and this, that, and the other, and that's all fine. But do you know what the greatest miracle is? That I'm in that now. How do I become divinity? How do I get a place into that Godhead? That's huge. That's, that's more of a miracle than raising the dead. Hmm? Because that, I can't, you can't make that happen. You can't do... I mean, that. How do you, I'm going to be inside of God? How, I'm going to be perfect? I'm going to be all that He says I am? That me being in the Godhead is the very first of many miracles, and it's the greatest. So let me ask you: Would you go? Would you rather have be separate and raise somebody from the dead, or be in the Godhead and not raise somebody from the dead? Yeah. So now we got the greatest of miracles. Anything less, anything other than this is less than that. So the, all the other miracles are less than. So let's go do them, because we've got the greatest miracle that happened right now, and that's us in Him and He in us. And wait till I get to unity. It's going. To, I mean, I, I I can't even believe it. Some of the stuff I'm coming up with, I'm like, Ugh. but it's it's right. Did you think of your? Are you blind? Yeah, but I did just think that's where our power comes from. If we don't know who we are in Christ, and and recognize this this greatest miracle of being in the Trinity, then those miracles aren't going to happen because then we see it as us doing them instead of the power of God through us. Yeah, and that's the fullness. Them. Yeah. You know, she said something just made me think. How many people do you think are in college right now and they have no clue? I was talking to a friend of mine that uh, took, um, oh, man, what did he take? He took some class in, uh, at Fairmont State. He went back to school. He was in his 40s when he went back. And um, he took, I think it was some type of a biology class or something. But um, he's like, when he was in there after so many days or weeks, he's like, uh, I'm over my head. I have no clue. And he's like 40-some years old at the time. And he's, got, he's looking over at these foreign kids, these Chinese kids, some Asian kids or something. They're like 19. 18, 19, and it's like 101 to them. And he's like, I'm out of my element. Because he, he didn't have that, that ability to comprehend, so he, had, he, had, he just had to get out of that class and realize, okay, I, I can't do that. But how many are in the Godhead as he was? Because we don't know. But it's not that you don't know because of your, I, your spiritual IQ or your physical IQ. It's you're you you're like him. You're like him in a class. You're in the Godhead, but the truth has not yet set you free in certain areas of your <clears throat> life. But you're there. You're in the class, but there's still yet more to know to get the fullness of who you are in that class. So I I would say we're all, I mean definitely we're all here, but fullness that depends on what has been renewed in your mind. And that's why Paul is so adamant in Ephesians about God opening the eyes of your understanding. That you may be rooted and grounded in Him. That you may know Him and the riches of His grace and all of that. Because there's still more to know. Because our mind and transformation comes by the renewing of the mind. So we're constantly on this quest of renewal, 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 renewing the mind. Make sense? Yep. Anything else? Now look here, it says next week we're not going to have anything, no service, no Thursday night next week because it's Thanksgiving. Now, however, that's going to be two weeks, so I didn't really want to get anything heavy this week because we're going to skip a week. So we just went light tonight, kind of just like an introductory thing, so that if you, have, if you feel like you know, you're jumping into making it practical and yet I don't understand the, the depth of the Trinity... So what I want to encourage you to do, if that's you, now if you're like, hey, I know where I'm ready, then just meditate on this for the next couple of weeks and, and who you are in him. But if you don't feel like you got the Trinity yet, because if you don't have the Trinity down under your belt, at least a
decent revelation of it, then it's not, you're not going to be able to walk the practical out because you still don't have that revelation of you and him and he and you. So what I want to encourage you to do for the next two weeks, because it's going to be two weeks before we come back here again, take two weeks and get on the Internet and get on the web page and look at, go to tr the Trinity and re-watch some of those. Or if you don't know where it's at on the web page, then go to the YouTube page and hit, go to my, our, my YouTube page, hit playlist, and then you'll see Trinity, the Trinity, and all of them are there. And if you hit one, it'll play them all back. You, you can binge on my Trinity messages rather than Netflix over Thanksgiving holiday. You can just sit there, it'll play one right after the other till you, till, till, till you go through it. But it's there. So I want to encourage you to do that. And even if you did know it and you, you got some downtime, watch some of those again. Because I'm telling you, where we're going to go, we're going to flip everything you learned religiously on its head. And these topics, you'll never see these topics the same again. And I promise you that. Which one did I say, if, if you don't, I'll buy your dinner? Which one? Unity. 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 <sighs> Man. That, I got a little bit more on that today, and I'm like, oh, my God, that, that, that's too good to be true and too wild. And yet when you look at it, it's like, my God's <clears throat> been sitting there telling us this all week long, or for however many years the Bible's been written, and we, we, you, you're not hearing it anywhere. And the church is so divided. There's so much hate in the church. There's so much unforgiveness. When, I teach, when, we, when the Spirit teaches on unity, you're going to like... Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You're going to shake your head and walk out of here in disgust. Oh, well, bittersweet. You'll be disgusted but happy you now know the truth. Good stuff. I promise you. What's coming is good. Or I wouldn't waste your time sharing it. Amen? Why don't you pray, Randy, since, you, since you're up here. Uh, give me a break. Lord, we thank you for the continued revelations and renewing of mind that you give us. Um, week after week and revealing to us who we are in you and who you are in us and that trinity God that you've placed us in we thank you for um, these revelations I ask that you would continue to open the eyes of our understanding the, to open our hearts oh God to receive that from you if there's anything there Father God that um, is shutting that off Reveal that to us, God. Reveal it to us, God, and open our eyes, open our hearts to it, God. Make us um, understand it, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. See you, not next week, week after next. Yeah.